pleasure to be sharing even if virtually this session. Let's go directly to the point. So the title of this no, well, this case is an optimal left main PCI, and probably per most of you, you will immediately understand what I'm about to talk about. Anyway, we will disclose why optimal at the end. Anyway, this is the clinical case: 77 years old male with some risk factors and some comorbidities, as you can see: rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's syndrome, sclerodermia, and in 2019, stroke. The cardiac history started with an inferior STEMI treated with thrombolysis in 2000, so it's a long time ago, and some disciplinary and atypical chest pain since 2020. So or, almost 20 years of wellness from this. From this okay. Anyway, transthoracic echocardiography. Like. Yes. Anyway, I was about to introduce the transthoracic echocardiography, which actually is not very interesting, considering the ejection fraction is around 50% with some mild inferior mid-basal hypokinesia. This patient has been referred to cardiac MRI before actually entering the cardiac lab. So the report from the art MRI is ejection fraction 47% with some infra mid basal wall akinesia, basal inferior dyskinesia, and during pharmacological stress, there was septal anteroepical inducible ischemia. So just to refresh, he, he had an inferior STEMI to 20 years ago. So that's the MRI. As you can see, there are some, you know, some results of the previous inferior MI. You can see that the ejection fraction is almost normal, almost normal. And in this view, in the short axis, you see clearly, clearly the, what happened 20 years ago with this akinesia in the posterior wall. Let's have a look at the basal angel. So the right coronary is honestly without any interest for us, but the interest is coming. So that's the problem of, or for this man. There is some kind of tight stenosis of the osteal LAD, obviously involving the, the left main, but also some disease of the proximal part of the LAD. And I want to show you again some uh, disease involving also the osteum of the circumflex. These are some numbers and calculations, as you can see. Of course, there's no time to express our concern, my concern in particular for these numbers. However, if you look at the total SYNCTAS score one is 23, meaning that this patient will probably be better treated by, me by means of cabbage. If you look at the SYNCTAS score, the number is 41. So the SYNCTAS score two says that the treatment recommendation can be either cabbage or PCI. But if you look at the SYNCTAS score 2020, there is, uh, I would say, a wide difference in terms of 10 years mortality well, in com as compared to cabbage and PCI. But of course, as we are here, and this patient has been referred to PCI from the attending physician. But it's time, I guess, Alaide, to discuss about the strategy. So I'll show you again what's on the menu, and I'll leave you the word. Okay, so clearly we are in ABC and our belief in ABC and from all the consensus that have been published and I'm a fully believer and follow the group is provisional, which is not just put a stent across and it is always important to remind, but is the stepwise approach that was also um, recently published and it was in the EBC main. So personally, I would stand uh, across uh, clearly protected both uh, branches stent across uh, then doing uh, a pot recross uh, and then uh, eventually kiss um, but this is clearly again very uh, big part of, uh, of discussion and then uh, clearly which stent are all the stent equal and another question is imaging I mean, I would personally do imaging, and I don't think all the stents are, are the same. I, I would agree with that. I, I think the key issue here, though, is imaging up front, isn't it, to, to really take out some of the ambiguity that the angiogram yeah. is providing us, because what's not clear is how heavily involved that circumflex ostium yeah. might be. Thanks to the chairman for my invitation to European Bifurcation Club 2021 and to Boston Scientific for the invitation to participate in this symposium, an optimal left main PCI, with specific reference to a practical approach to IVUS guided left main bifurcation PCI. 
So the advantages in my mind of IVUS guidance are to assess lesion morphology, particularly looking at branch involvement and calcific burden, potentially guiding modification strategy. Then to consider stent selection, sizing and the length according to healthy landing zones, and ultimately then to achieve stent optimization. I'd like to share a case to highlight these elements. So this is a complex case in her 70s, uh, presenting to a peripheral hospital with non-ST elevation myocardial infarction and found to have severe aortic stenosis with preserved ventricular function, but critical osteal left main stem disease. She was transferred to us and actually underwent BAV prior to the treatment of her osteal left main in anticipation of a TAVA. So this is her left coronary disease at the time of intervention, and it shows an exquisitely tight ostium to her left main associated with very high burden calcification in the aortic root. So a guide catheter is um, carefully introduced with flotation of a wire you see firstly into the circumflex and then ultimately down the LAD. Predilatation is undertaken just to stabilize the catheter and then IVUS is undertaken from uh, LAD uh, back into left main and I'll just bring you back through the IVUS here where we see a quadrant of calcification from two through till four or four o'clock as so we come through the proximal LED. And here we see the circumflex wire coming up at seven o'clock and actually then a higher burden as we'd expect of calcification within the body of the left main stem, not quite circumferential. And then we come back into the ostium where we saw that exquisitely tight disease and we already see some disruption by the initial ballooning. Again, non-circumferential almost completely circumferential calcium at this point, and then really quite gnarly kind of nodular calcium at the level of the ostium uh, to the left main stem and a large osteal left main into aorta. So my interpretation of this actually with the protrusive and high burden nature of the calcium is that actually rotational atherectomy is going to be necessary to try and achieve an effective uh, expansion of a stenting device. And actually, we see here that protrusive nature, and importantly, also by IVUS, can confirm the position of the uh, interventional guide wire, which here is in contact with the roof of the left main, where the burden of calcium might be. And so one would hope that with multiple uh, rotor runs that we can effectively debulk the lesion. In fact, here we see angiographically a slight improvement following that maneuver. And then again, with a repeat IBUS, we can confirm that we have effectively modified. And again, we see here the circumflex and importantly, relative sparing of the circumflex ostium in terms of disease. So supporting the potential for a provisional approach. And here we see modification, in fact, with the wire now placed within a, a cavity generated by the Burr passage. And we can see the before and after comparison demonstrating really quite effective modification prior to stent implantation. So a stent is selected based upon the IVUS measurements, and we have a 3.5 by 16 millimeter stent. Sadly, this is prior to the introduction of Megatron, but actually the, the nature of Megatron would have been ideal here in terms of the osteal um, placement, need for overexpansion, and uh, potential for recoil long-term. Place a four millimeter, initially four millimeter pot distally and extend that back to the ostium. And then importantly, take an angiogram, which looks effective, but actually the IVUS uh, subsequently shows still some under expansion in the body of the left main. So here we see the stent edge is free of any dissection. We see the circumflex, which has been recrossed, but actually still some under expansion and eccentricity to the result, which angiographically looks acceptable. Again, just confirming the importance of this IVUS guided approach. So further optimization with a 4.5 millimeter balloon is undertaken and importantly a final IVUS run is taken to confirm adequate expansion and then we see a much much more favorable expansion achieving uh, MSA above 10 millimeters squared ultimately ach achieving a good result. Now, in hindsight actually it would have been useful for this patient to have undergone CT prior to that uh, procedure but actually they went forward and had a pre-TAVI uh, CT following stenting and we see what the IVUS has determined for us, this very high burden of calcification at the aortic root. And I think this really, again, confirms that the strategy as adopted by IVUS for use of rotational atherectomy was entirely appropriate.
This lady actually returned only uh, earlier this year with some atypical chest pain and due to the high risk nature of previous intervention underwent angiography, which gratifyingly shows an excellent ongoing result two years later. So I hope that in that short case, I have confirmed the advantages of IVIS guidance for left main PCI through assessing lesion morphology, the importance of recognition of calcification and subsequent modification, the consideration of stent sizing, and ultimately the importance of stent optimization to ensure a long-term excellent result for our patients. I thank you for your attention. Thank you for, for the talk. I think it was very precise and get to the case. I mean, uh, we have been discussing about this uh, for years and we are, do, we are believers on that and luckily also data are coming on this direction. Honestly, to do a complex left main without imaging, I, I mean, I think it's something we should never suggest. And you show very clearly the importance also to guide the procedure from the lesion uh, preparation until uh, the stent optimization. Um, so you show us uh, the guidance with IBUS that actually is what uh, I'm doing too. But what about OCT? That is the other imaging yeah. and it's coming also in the setting of uh, the left main. Well, I think I, I'm, that's an important point to raise, Lady. And I think it's, it's often the case that we talk about these as competing technologies in the same way that we've just had a session on IVL and we're now shown a case of rotor. There isn't one tool that fixes every job. And so there are benefits, pros and cons for each. <clears throat> and I, I think here, this, this case example, we have a lady with very, very advanced osteal left main stem disease, which is much more appropriate for IVUS. The, the trade-off between IVUS and the OCT would be the resolution. And I think if proceeding to a complex two-stent technique, then the resolution for me helps by OCT. But there's a trade-off. And so I think both modalities have their, have their role. I mean, also the one that you are more familiar with, because that's important. Important yeah. is that the guidance means interpretation of the images and it's not given by itself by the technology. So also, I mean, not maybe for the people that are in this panel, but especially the one they are starting programs with left main, get to be familiar with one of the two technique. Uh, familiar means able to really interpret the result uh, from the lesion preparation to the optimization and then I would advise to use that technology and then maybe in a later phase uh, being able also to, to choose. At least this is my personal point. I don't know about Luca. Yeah, well, do you think? I Which is your generally attitude? agree with all the things that you just said. I only see a real big limitation. Uh, well, and on top of what you just said, I mean, the OCT requires, let's say, probably a steeper learning curve because it's not as immediate as the IBUS, in particular because IBUS is there since 30 years. So we all grew up learning, looking, doing IBUS. Also, if you look at the, for example, at the practice of doing a complex PCI to left main, I will never, never suggest to do the OCT three times, four times, five times. It takes time, it takes contrast. So considering the age of our patients, I will never say, look, you can do either one. Hmm. Let's do what you are more familiar, that's for sure. However, if you balance the risk of doing and the benefit of doing, I will say that's in favor of Avus. That's my opinion, of course. Okay, it's a good point. I mean, I'm for by school, I'm more Avus guided than OCT guided, but I accept that other uh, in other collabs, there is a growing experience with the OCT and sure. we have to admit sure, that. Sure, sure. But look, what, what I just said is just that, of course, we need to be practical. I mean, any suggestion or, or indication must be based on real life. So, I mean, there is also a lot of barrier concerning the budget, the time constraint, using imaging, generally speaking. So if you add on top of this, the contrast issue, well, probably it's not a good suggestion. However, as you said before, and Tom confirmed, I mean, the OCT, of course, is the best in class in terms of resolution. 
That's not my opinion. That's reality. So in other words, use what you feel is better for your job. However, in terms of general concept, I would say the IBUS is also better standardized as compared to the OCT, which is another point. So, I mean, of course, the OCT is much younger. Nevertheless, is a fantastic tool. Of course, I'm not saying who's best. I'm the, saying, uh, the, in practice, the probably, probably for the IBUS, it's, uh, there is more larger space. May I add a brief remark? Yeah, okay. sure. Um, uh, recently, there is a Japanese uh, guiding extension, which is translucent. And Yoshi Murasato, which is a well-known member of this club, has reported using this guiding extension to image with OCT the whole length of the left main. And I think if properly used and uh, provided it's not occlusive, this might extend the uh, indications for OCT for left main interventions. That, no, that sure. was the remark. I mean, yeah. I agree there are also growing data on that direction. I mean, I'm, I'm more open. I have to say that by school, I'm more IVUS oriented and I agree that IVUS is also more comfortable during your Calab uh, every day. Also, there is, uh, at least in Italy, because it's not reimbursed, we have to say in Italy, it's not reimbursed either IVUS or an OCT, which is the difference, by the way, with Japan. And, uh, and but again, there is also growing experience and data with OCT, so we have to accept also the importance sure. of this uh, technology uh, in guiding. What is important again is to be familiar, to interpret data, and to use that guidance uh, uh, appropriately to have uh, a better selection for uh, preparation of the lesion and also for optimization of, uh, of the result, I think. So, Luca, I think I, you I, can uh, continue can I, can with... I just, uh, can I just comment a yes. little bit on the discussion of OCT versus IVUS? And I use uh, OCT in 90% of my cases for left main. I just want to say in this case, this particular case, I don't think that OCT is very adequate for one reason is that the lesion is so tight. And I've had, in the beginning of my OCT career in left main, a case where I filled up the whole tree, artery tree, with contrast. And because the lesion was so tight, there's no flow. What happens is that the patient gets <laughs> cardiac arrest because you yeah, fill sure. it up with contrast. So in this particular case, I think it's very dangerous to do OCT unless you do much more deep bulking with rotor ablation. I, uh, you wouldn't want to do this because that's very dangerous. I, yeah, I, think yeah, this, I think this is all really great discussion, but I, I'd want to bring us all back into the real world, which is the reality that regardless of what's done in this room, in the vast majority of cath labs, imaging is not used at all. So an argument about which modality is probably not the case. It's about getting people to possibly engage with imaging, or at least to get the evidence, which maybe Luca is going to lead on to, to, to ensure that we can then drive things forwards. Yeah. OK, so Luca, if you can uh, go on yeah, with the case sure. continuation, I will. Us, uh, how did you manage the case? I will. Uh, anyway, so that the, these were the calculations, the strategy we discussed. And of course, we proceeded with, with new, uh, well, using a non-compliant balloon to predilate the proximal LED, and then with the implantation of a synergy three uh, by twenty-four, followed by the post dilatation with non-compliant balloon with three millimeters, and then we use we use the Megatron four by twenty for to treat the ostial LED and the left main stem. As you can see, we actually position it in two views as usual. That's very traditional, nothing special about it. And then a kissy balloon, because as Alaide pointly said before, of course, we used a stepwise approach. And in this case, I think it's really appropriate to use a provisional T because the lesion to the ostial LCX was not that important. Although, of course, there was some involvement, but I would say that that lesion was around 20%, so nothing special. So, pot technique with an NC balloon, four millimeters, and then that's the IVUS run. As you can see, it's very relatively short, so I'll, I'll let it go. But the numbers are on the right side of the slide. As you can see, the left main shaft has been measured around 6.5 millimeters square, and then the proximal LED was 4.3 4 millimeters square. It is obvious that those numbers are not enough. 
So we proceeded with another post dilatation with non compliant balloon 4 millimeters for the osteal LAD and then 4.5 for the uh, left main stem. And then we proceeded with another IBUS. And with another IBUS, of course, that's what we obtained. So 11 millimeters square for the left main shaft and 7 millimeters square for the proximal LAD. So, in other words, we achieved some numbers that nowadays are considered to be acceptable in terms of guidance done by the IBUS. And this is what we should discuss now because. Of course, there are a lot of criteria, but those, I would say, mostly used worldwide are those coming from the Asian experience and the other coming from the Caucasian experience. However, in the case that I just showed you, the number were actually consistent with both. But of course, there is a lot of debate around what is the real, or let's say, paramount numbers we should consider. Nevertheless, I would say that is something that we are still testing because at the end, of course, this trial, well, this patient has been enrolled in a trial, and this trial, of course, required a very specific protocol. This specific protocol has been summarized in the optimal trial. I'm happy and honored to be the PI of this, and this is still ongoing. We are just surpassed 220 patients. Uh, this trial is actually ongoing in the UK, Italy, and, and Spain. So we are trying to demonstrate that the IWAS should be routinely used, imaging, but and actually IWAS should be routinely used in the treatment of left main. But of course, waiting for the data, we'll try to confirm what is our hypothesis. These are my takes on. The IWAS should be part of the routine and pre-specified IWAS goals are paramount because you must use IWAS and use the data coming from the IWAS, meaning that the IWAS data that must be actionable. The optimal trial has been designed to demonstrate in a randomized adequate size population the favorable impact of this strategy on clinical outcomes. That was the end and open for the discussion. So thank you, Luca. Very interesting study. And in the in the study in the randomized uh, trial, so which criteria are you using? We are using the to Excel define one. optimization. Excel one, but, but of course we will evaluate also according to the ethnicity because we will have a look. In particular, uh, the you know the body mass index, the body size of the of the patient, because as you know, Laide, there is a lot of debate. But this debate is actually pointless because it is pointless to believe that a very old lady coming from the far east might be having the same left mate that I have. So, in other words, it's obviously impossible to believe that five, six, or seven are good for everyone. This is not the case. Left main is an anatomical structure, and like any other anatomical structure, is obviously related to this body size. That's the point. Okay, I mean, clearly, also regarding criteria, there are so many discussions. There are there will be ongoing yeah. other kind of trials with other kind of uh, criteria. But I think that the real news is actually Tom pointed out is to put on, actually in, right in the middle of the discussion, the fact that the people is not using imaging. Very Well, that's the very first point, top of the list, is to convince people that there is enough evidence. However, the indication coming from the guidelines are still 2AB. 2AB because there's no randomized control trial. So the idea was exactly to challenge the guidelines. I'm not saying that I will be right. I'm just saying we are trying to challenge what is known so far. I mean, there are some randomized clinical trial we did once uh, some years ago. Unfortunately, this was uh, not a clinical endpoint. And by the way, the study was negative because uh, we were not able in all the center to really reach the, the criteria because I, yeah. I mean, we have also to take this into account. We have another question uh, now, from Robert Jan, I think, a lady. Okay, so there is another question, and we have to move uh, to the last talk because I think we are a little bit late. So, but please. Uh, Give us the question. Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, Luca, did you also, do, what's your opinion about doing the IFAS of the circumflex? You showed us the IFAS of the left main to LAD. Should we always, especially as you did do the kissing, do IFAS of both arms? Okay, so my idea, my personal idea is to test both branches because the le distal left main is by nature at least a bifurcation. So in uh, the real, real world, maybe you just test where you see let's say the most significant disease, the, the highest burden of disease. However, in theory, and that's my suggestion, but of course this questionable, 
is to test both branches. Ideally, you should do that. However, I must say that as per protocol, we decided to, you know, to mandate the IVUS only for distinct segments. So if you go for provisional T and then you do not put another stent in the side branch, that side branch can be left alone. But if you put a stent, you must use IVUS afterwards. That's the protocol. So I followed the protocol and I didn't test the IVUS to the left main to the circumflex. Clearly, we will be more than uh, happy and we look forward then to see the result of, of the study. Uh, now we can move to the last talk. Uh, they told me that uh, Nicolas is present in the room, so he's going to give the lecture live, and the lecture is left main PCI. Do we need a purpose built stand? Thank you, Alady. Uh, dear friends, dear colleagues, uh, thanks for, to the EBC and, uh, and Boston Scientific for this uh, invitation. And um, this slide displays you different aspects of left main um, that I found on my hard drive while preparing the, the talk. And you see that uh, I think it's a good illustration of the diversity of the shape, size, and anatomy uh, of, this, uh, of this vessel. And uh, we know that the left main is different from the other coronary bifurcation because, uh, well, first it's in a vital site and uh, uh, it has a very proximal uh, location. It's the, the most proximal um, bifurcation. Um, the left main also has larger diameters and wider main branch, side branch angled compared to other bifurcation. There is a frequent non-cylindric shape of the main vessel and also frequent uh, involvement of trifurcation in around 10% of the case. Um, moreover, we also know that the, compared to other bifurcation, uh, the side branch occlusion is not really acceptable because of the potential consequences. And finally, there are more marked diameter discrepancies. So, of course, these uh, very uh, special features also involve uh, different uh, risk of uh, uh, complications that we have to overcome while performing a PCI. Uh, for example, that this, uh, this was an osteal left main uh, uh, tight stenosis that appeared after uh, cardiac surgery. And uh, when we had to fix this uh, osteal uh, left main, uh, we observed that the diastole, the, the, the left knee was extremely large and um, the diastole landing zone displayed a diameter of more than 6.3 millimeters, which involved a very, very large stent uh, to get a correct result. And that was a quite a challenge. And it's not so isolated, and I'm sorry, I don't know why the, this, um, the slides are not uh, adequately um, presented, whatever. Uh, these uh, left la large left main are not that unusual because, uh, uh, for example, if you're looking by IVUS, you observe that um, there are a, six, uh, a substans substantial uh, percentage of patients displaying um, average diameter over 5.5 millimeters. So once again, extremely large left main. Moreover, the left main shape, when you look at it with CT scan, is not cylindric. And there, uh, it's there is in almost all cases different significant dis difference in the lumen area between the ostium and the diastole, and uh, in 33 percent of the cases, the left main ostium is larger than the diastole left main. So that's also something that we have to keep in mind when doing PCI. And when we look at with uh, OCT, so once again with intraconary imaging, you observe that it's not. Uh, um, the, the, it's not a cylinder, but it's also quite eccentric. And uh, these are some data from Lemons that we're going to present tomorrow, and in which we measured the ratio between the minimal and the maximal diameter in different points of the left main, and we observed that actually um, around 35% of the patients displayed a marked eccentricity of their left main, which involved that there is a higher risk of malaposition in, this, in the left main, and you need a stent that could be overexpanded and uh, to correctly cover all the vessel. Um, there's also some diameter discrepancies between the main vessel and the main branch, and this is an example of um, uh, an osteal LAD lesion that we treated 
with um, uh, by by a CTO technique and in which we performed uh, IVUS analysis just afterwards and you see here that actually there was a quite di a huge discrepancy between the distal uh, landing zone on the LAD with a diameter of 3.1 and a proximal um, landing zone uh, diameter of 5.3 so if you want to cross uh, the lesion with a, uh, and treat the lesion with a one single stent you need a stent that can um, afford that, that, that can come to, to both diameter and that can be um, increased and over expanded up to 5.3 and if we're looking at the most recent uh, um, devices that we have in the cath lab um, it's quite interesting to see that not all the stands can go up to 5.5 or 6 and we see that these kind of diameters are quite frequent and um, so that's uh, that's an issue that we have to keep in mind moreover um, because of the osteolocation location uh, or the very proximal location of the of the of the left main we know that um, implanting a stent in the left main is also at risk for longitudinal compression and that's a, a, I mean a terrible um, uh, illustration of this longitudinal compression with OCT you see that there was no real uh, we did not suspect that on the NGO, although the result was so-so, uh, but with uh, uh, the um, RCT we observed that the, the stent was almost reduced uh, of 50% in its length. So, of course, um, there are different factors influencing the stent longitudinal compression, including some uh, anatomical factors, some procedure, procedural factors, but the stent design also matters and um, from the work by, of John Norminston um, years ago, we know that the alloy type, the strut thickness, the design, including the number of connectors on the proximal hoops, peak, peak or peak valley between hoops and in phase out of phase design, all these factors will influence the resistance of the stent to the compression. And uh, so when we are when we walking on the left main, we need really a stent that has uh, Strang, uh, a strong um, resistance to compression on the very proximal part. Finally, um, the last issue or the last concern that we can have while performing PCI on the left main is the size of the side uh, of the of the cell because it will influence the our ability to adequately wire the side branch and by an adequate wiring, I um, mean. Uh, being able to put a wire into a cell connecting to the carina and also because that's the side branch is quite large you can whatever if it's a circumflex or LED it means that you need to really over expand um, your cell uh, to large diameter in order to get the optimal scaffolding you need so as you understood when we are doing when we are dealing with a stand for left main we have some specific needs and these specific needs are requested by the specific risk that I expose to you. And so the solutions will come by uh, a reinforced structure, some nice over expansion capacities, an increased trackability and some large cells to access correctly to the side branch. And also I think uh, the cherry on the cake is an optimal radio opacity, opacity because of course you are doing some pre very precise um, PCI, especially if you are trying to cover correctly the ostium of the left main, so it's very important to be able to correctly uh, see your stand. So in this perspective, um, I think that with the Synergy Megatron, we have an adequate tool uh, in the cath lab now because, uh, well, it has a reinforced structure on the proximal part that, that is uh, related to the presence of four connectors on the proximal two segments. Um, um, the the, la the, di the more distal part of the stand is, uh, is quite comparable to a synergy. The very important point is the excellent um, conformability and overexpansion capacities of this stand and uh, the ability of the, uh, and the large um, uh, cell that can be really expanded up to five. And so uh, in this perspective, I think that's a very, very good stand for left main PCI. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Thanks uh, Nicola, great presentation. Um, I don't know if there are comments from Thomas uh, 
Tom or Luca on this. I think it was quite straightforward. I mean, not all the stents are equal and there are stents that are best suitable because of all the characteristics that Nicola just listed for, for the left main. Uh, if there are no other comments uh, from Luca or Tom, do you have any comments or from uh, the audience? Just reiterate what Nicola has had to say in terms of the importance of acknowledging the difference of left main in terms of its characteristics with eccentricity, with the radial strength required at the ostium. Um, so clearly there may be the need for a, a, a novel design for, for treating this area. So it's, it's beautifully outlined by, by the findings that he's picked out from Lemon. So please. Yeah, thank you, uh, Alira. Just to have this comment, I think it is absolutely important no, no, to realize no, no, no. which pressure you need no, no, no. to have over expansion. Go. So all the studies we have been doing, uh, uh, Nicola has been doing that you show if you want to over expand the three five or four zero stent, if you just use your balloon and your balloon pressure, it says it is twelve atmospheres, it will be five millimeters. Due to the resistance of the metal, you will need sixteen or sometimes 20 atmospheres to reach this kind of expansion. So if you read the, the studies done, look also at the pressure you need to have over expansion. Yeah, that, that's, that's correct. And uh, that's also a point. It's not only about the sense, it's also about the way you, you, you perform your side dilation, or your kissing. OK, so thanks for the question. If there are no other questions, I think uh, in the sake of time, uh, we will wrap up this session. It was a, a short but intense, I would say, session with a very nice case from Luca, uh, showing us uh, the stepwise approach according to ABC rules, I have to say. So thanks, Luca. And uh, Tom uh, just showing us the importance of the guidance of imaging uh, uh, to decide your strategy for preparation of the lesion and get also to optimization of the result. Uh, we knew about, look about uh, this new randomized clinical trial that is always needed, especially for our, us as believers, because we really want to get uh, a more straightforward recommendation from the guidelines. And then finally, Nicolas, that was pointing out again that all not the stents are equal. There are stents that are most suitable for the left main because of all the details, technical details that were described. So thanks to all uh, for the uh, participation and great talks and also interaction, despite we are virtual and live, and hope to see you in the next session.